It's been a long time since we've had a week that uh, had as many events in it. Uh, Ron had his surgery on Wednesday, and uh, things went well as far as the surgery was concerned, but uh, he's still in ICU. They've requested no visitors until he moves to a room because he's having some problems regulating blood pressure and other things. Jerry uh, Perkins goes to the hospital, and Billy Burton is in the hospital across the hall from Jerry and having a uh, chemo drip, very slow to try to uh, uh, make the effects less, and uh, so we're concerned about them. And then we have great rejoicing. Evelyn has put up with Melvin for 50 years. Yesterday, yesterday was the day, and Janet has put up with Jim for 40 years, I'm told. Is that today? That's today. Boy, that's just wonderful uh, to see that transpiring and uh, see the, the blessing that's there. Uh, not easy, not easy to live together and uh, be able to uh, demonstrate to the whole world what God's plan in our life is to be. And uh, then this week was just filled with all sorts of bad news. A lot of, a lot of political upheaval. A lot of social hypocrisy. A lot of people saying ugly things about other people only to discover that they're guilty themselves. And wow, we look at that and we say, what's this world coming to? And the truth of the matter is, it's always been that way, probably. It's always been that way. We look at what the Apostle Paul is going to be saying to the church at Rome this morning in chapter 2, and and, and these, in particular, Jewish Christians that he is looking at, and you say, things haven't changed much, have they? There's always those who are saying, I'm going to be a corrector of the foolish. I, I, I'm going to teach you the way that it's supposed to be done. And yet the truth of the matter is, we aren't doing too well ourselves when we're trying to correct others. That's what Paul is going to be talking about as we study this great passage that Albert read for us a few minutes ago. Read a wonderful story this, this week that, that kind of illustrates verse 1 through verse 3 of Romans chapter 2. It's a story of a small town baker. He bought all of his butter from a local farmer. After weighing his butter, he concluded the farmer had been reducing the amount in the packages but charging the same price. Therefore, the baker accused the farmer of fraud. In court, the judge asked the farmer, Do you have a measuring weight? No, sir, replied the farmer. Well, how do you manage to weigh the butter that you sell? Well, the farmer said, It's simple. When the baker began buying his butter from me, I thought I'd better get my bread from him. I've been using his one-pound loaf of bread as the weight for the butter I sell. If the weight of the butter is wrong, he has only himself to blame. Therefore, you have no excuse, Paul says, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. Isn't that a great irony? Isn't that a great irony? We look at our brother, we look at our sister, we look at people in the world, and we say, you know, their problem is, and we begin to maybe even point it out to them personally, only to discover if we would take the time to look into our own hearts, our own minds, our own actions, that we may not be guilty of what they are guilty of, but we're guilty of something just as great. And how we need to stop and take stock of ourselves. 
Am I being the light that Jesus has asked me to be? Am I being the salt that Jesus has asked me to be? Am I trying to accomplish God's will in my life? You see, Paul, as he begins to address the church at Rome, is, is very desirous to, to make them obedient to the Word, verse 5, chapter 1. He, he says, and I want you to know that the gospel really is God's power. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, verse 16. It is the power of God for salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed, and there's the standard. The righteousness of God is revealed. So that the righteous man shall live by faith. I think that's why Jesus was so very, very adamant in what we call the Sermon on the Mount to point out to us the necessity of being very, very careful how we judge one another, how we look at one another. Chapter 7, Matthew, verse 1, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, that's the standard you'll be judged by. Is that a little terrifying to you when you stop and think of the import, the implication that's there? Blessed are the merciful, Jesus has already said. Why? They will receive mercy. Beware of being the judge, for the judgment that you give is the judgment you'll receive. And then he goes on. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? <coughs> you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You know, I know this is a very, very difficult thing for us because we always can see what's going on in someone else's life more clearly than what we can see what's going on in our own life, can't we? We can always look at the person who is struggling, the person who is stumbling, the person who has difficulty, and we can say, oh, look at them. Look at the problem they have. Look at the difficulty that is there. Look, look they ought to change that. But how often do we look at ourselves and say, hmm, look at the struggle that's in my life. Look at the difficulty that is there. That's why the Apostle Paul, in addressing the church at Corinth, talked to them in the second letter, chapter 13, verse 5. He says, examine yourselves, test yourselves to see whether or not you're of the faith. Make sure that you're in a right relationship with God, and once you are in a right relationship with God and your life is straightened out, then you're going to have to have the privilege of helping others. Therefore, you have no excuse. That's how Paul starts. Every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same things. He's going to go on in chapter 2, getting down to verse 19, and he says, Look at yourselves, you Jews in particular now, but it's something that we can apply to ourselves very readily. He says, you are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having the law, the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. You, therefore, who teach another, do you teach yourself? You who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You see, the point that Paul is trying to make to us is that we've got to be very, very careful that we're living our lives in a way that is acceptable for God before we ever are capable of trying to help someone else. We can't take the speck out of the brother's eye when we have the two before in our own eye. We, we can't get them to change their small difficulty 
if we're not willing to wrestle with the big difficulty that's in our life. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. If that were the end of the teaching, I suppose that we might take it or leave it. If that were the end of the thing that, that Paul says to the church at Rome here, we, we probably would say to ourselves, oh yeah, that's a good teaching. But we would walk right out the door and we would say, you know, brother so-and-so, he really needs to. Sister so-and-so, she really needs to. But then you get down to verse 2. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. The judgment of God is going to be against those who are in transgression of what God, God's will for our life is. And so what do we need to do? We need to be looking inwardly and introspectively and saying, how do I need to be more like Christ? What do I need to do to grow into his likeness? Yes, we are to judge with righteous judgment. We love to quote that. But the problem that I see is that when we judge with self-righteous judgment is where we find the problem. Righteous judgment is God's judgment, God's standard. We encourage, we strengthen one another by preaching the word, by teaching the message, by sharing the news. That's the challenge. But when we point out faults, that when we're not willing to deal with our own faults and problems, that's where the problem comes in. So this is a great warning. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. Verse 3, the consequence of righteous judgment. Do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same thing yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? I, I, I'm going to get a hold of my brother because he lied to me. I'm going to condemn him because he lied to me. Have you ever lied to him? That was exactly the problem or difficulty that the Jew had. And here he says that when you pass judgment and you practice the same thing, you're going to find yourself under God's judgment in a great deal of conflict and adversity. That's the setting for what I believe is the real meat of this text. What do we need to do? We need to accept the greatest of opportunities that God has given to us. And that is repent. We need to look into our own hearts and our own lives and examine ourselves and come to the understanding that when we fall short, we need to change. I've lived long enough, preached long enough to see a lot of people make tremendous shipwrecks of their lives. And when I look at them and I say, how come they made a shipwreck? <clears throat> how come they, they've lost their faith? I would almost assure you that, that many times, the majority of the times, maybe as much as nine times out of ten, shipwreck happened because of a lack of repentance. Repentance. There was something in their life that they wanted to cling on to and hang on to so desperately <clears throat> that they would literally shake their fist at God 
and say, I'm not going to change. And yet God has given to us one gift that makes such a difference. It's that gift of repentance. Do you not think lightly of the riches of His kindness, verse 4? His tolerance, His patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. You look at God in all of His vastness, God in His creative power, God in, in all of His completeness, and you say, Wow, look at our Creator. And He looks down upon us as individuals and He says to us as individuals, I'm going to give you my kindness. I'm going to give you patience and tolerance. I'm going to share these things with you because I want you to turn from evil, from judgment, from wrong in your own life so that you can become more mine. So that you can become more what God wants us to be. Oh, the nature of God as He looks at His creation, that kindness. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That tolerance. God is not willing that any man should perish, but that all men should come to repentance, as Peter records the words. That patience, the long-suffering of God toward us, how He wants us to, to turn our lives into a right relationship with Him, how He wants us to conform ourselves to His righteousness, rather than to be haughty and to, to look at others and say, oh, look at them, look what they're doing, look the way they're acting, look at the way they're talking, look at the way they are not responding to God. And he looks at us and he says, are you responding to me? Look at what I've done for you. Look at what I'm asking for you. You know, one of the most triumphant stories in the Old Testament that's also one of the most tragic stories in the Old Testament is the story of Jonah. We love that little four-chapter book, don't we? Jonah runs from God, and then he runs toward God, only then to run away from God again. Jonah wasn't, wasn't real happy with the task God had given him to go on to preach to Nineveh. Nineveh, you know, they don't deserve anything. They're not God's people. They're, they're not selected. Jonah was making that great judgment. Why, why, why should they repent? God, come on down. Bring your justice down. That's what I want. I don't know how many times in my life I thought that and thought, oh, wait a second, Robert. If God gives his justice to them, will he not give his justice to you? And I really need his mercy. So finally, Jonah prays to the Lord in the last chapter. He says, Lord, I knew this is what was going to happen when Nineveh repents. Was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew, God, that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Jonah realized that God was willing to bring about freedom from sin. And when the Ninevites repented in sackcloth and ashes, God relented. And Jonah just wasn't happy. Every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same things. Jonah needed to learn that lesson. Needed to learn that lesson. So what do we need to do in our lives? Repent. Repent. Acts chapter 4 talks about times of refreshing. 
coming from the presence of the Lord. Verse 19, how does it come? When we repent, when we turn and look at our own hearts and our own lives in relationship to God and we say, God, be merciful to me. I am the sinner. I want to change. I want to become more like you. You know, the great story of the conversion of Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, repeated in Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. And as Paul shares the story in Acts 26, he was on the journey to Damascus. He's telling Agrippa and the others. He says, I had authority, I had commission of the chief priests. I saw the light from heaven brighter than the sun shining all around me. I fell to the ground. And in Hebrew, I heard these words, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it not hard for you to kick against the goads? Who are you, Lord? Paul says, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Get up, stand on your feet. For this purpose I've appeared to you, to appoint you a minister, a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also the things which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you, to open their eyes, so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith. So, King Agrippa, Paul says, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I kept declaring to those both of Damascus and at Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea, even to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, performing deeds appropriate To repentance. Warren Cole Smith in World Magazine in an article entitled Wins and Losses relates a story about the days of President Bush in the White House. It has to do with Tim Goglin who started running the White House Office of Public Liaison in 2001. It gave him almost daily access then to President George Bush for seven years. Then it all ended abruptly on Friday, February 29, 2008. A well-known blogger revealed the startling fact that 27 out of 39 of Goglin's published articles had been plagiarized. By mid-afternoon the next day, Goglin's career in the White House was over. Goglin, who admitted his guilt, said that this began a personal crisis unequaled in my life. I brought humiliation on my wife, my children, my family, my closest friends, including the President of the United States. Goglin was summoned to the White House to face the President. Once inside the Oval Office, Goglin shut the door, turned to the president, and began to say, I owe you an, and President Bush interrupted him and said, Tim, you are forgiven. Tim was speechless. He tried again, but sir, the president interrupted him again with a firm stop. And then he said to Goglin, I have known grace and mercy in my life, and you are forgiven. After a long talk with the president, a healing process was launched for Goglin, which included repentance, reflection, spiritual growth. Political power can lead to pride, Goglin later reflected. That was my sin, 100% pride, but offering and receiving forgiveness is a different kind of strength. That's the kind of strength I want to develop now. 
Do you not know that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? And when you understand that, and when you begin to assimilate it into the daily actions of your life, then your desire to judge those who are around you becomes extremely limited. Because you see, we're too busy trying to correct what's wrong in our own lives. Because God's goodness leads us to repentance. The lesson is yours. There may be someone here this morning who needs to respond to Christ in some way. We want to give you that opportunity. Maybe as a Christian you haven't been living as one who needs to examine his own heart and life before he tries to help others. Too judgmental, too critical. How we need to stop and look at ourselves and say, am I being what Christ wants me to be so that I can help others when I come in contact with them and their need? Maybe this morning you're not a Christian. You haven't come to Christ. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You're, you're even willing to confess that belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You're, you're willing to be responsive to Him. He asks you to be buried in a watery grave so that you can be cleansed by His blood. And being buried with Him in that watery grave, you're then raised to walk, as the Roman writer tells us so clearly in chapter 6, to walk in newness of life. And we can become new every morning because we've responded to the Christ. We sing a song that's designed to encourage those who might want to respond to Christ to do so. This morning as we sing that song, if you have a need in relationship to Christ, would you come while together we stand, while we sing this song to encourage. There's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day.